So as we dive into your questions and to try to see where does this land in, some, in different applications, um, I was going to make a couple of very brief introductory remarks about the way we deliberate. And I'm, I'm just going to do it extremely quickly because I want to allow time for your questions. But I just want to very briefly say those two things that are on the screen. As we deliberate practically about what the principles uh, Lionel has enunciated mean for practice, we've just really got to be careful about consequentialism. When you're doing ethics, you've got to be wary of the inadequacy of consequentialism. So consequentialism is that theory of ethical principle and practice that measures the rightness and wrongness of a certain action by its consequences, by its results. And we do this all the time, and quite rightly so. We foresee something that we're about to do, or the effects of something we're about to do, and we bear that in mind as we think whether we should do it or not. Um, the problem with consequentialism, as, as perfectly right as it is to use in various contexts, is that it's a very blunt instrument for making decisions, especially when the decisions we make are very complex. Um, and so, when we're dealing with something as massively complex as our environment, uh, as the worldwide interconnection of all the ecosystems and biosystems that have our environment and all the worldwide interconnected nature of our market capitalist economy and all the different interactions, it's a phenomenally complex set of interactions. And the consequences we might be considering might be distant from us not only in space, that is, they might not be a long way away on the other side of the world, they may be distant from us even in time. There may be consequences we're considering of what might happen in 10 or 20 years' time. As we come to consider um, reasoning together about environmental issues, we've got to be careful about basing all our arguments on a consequentialist argument. It's the first thing just to bear in mind. And the second is just to bear in mind that what Lionel has uh, presented for us, if we were to frame it in, in ethical principles, is really a set of four virtues that ought to drive the way we approach environmental ethics as Christians. If I could sort of summarise Lionel's talk, the virtues that we should seek as Christians in respect to the creation and the environment are firstly thankfulness, that is to recognise that the creation and its resources are a gift that have a worth and goodness of their own but are given to us to use by God. They have potential to be used and developed, as, he, as Lionel said, to be worked and to, and to, and to be um, developed. But, and we shouldn't think that uh, leaving the world alone or not interfering with it is an inherent good. It's not necessarily the case. But we should receive the gifts that God gives us with thankfulness and use them that way. And that as we use them, our use of them should be guided by the three great theological virtues of faith, love, and hope. That is, faith that God's way of living in the world is correct and that what he reveals to us about the world and its nature and its purposes are the true nature of things and be guided by that in our thinking as to what we think is important in the world and how the world should be and what Christ has done. By love, that is, by an other person-centred um, concern for the other that, that sacrifices ourselves as Christ did and gives up our own wants and needs for the sake of others, love being the opposite of greed. But love is shaped by faith. We love on the basis of what we know to be true that we understand by faith. The knowledge of God's world that we trust in by faith guides and orders our loves because love always has to be ordered. We always have to decide what we're going to love in what priority and order and how much we're going to love different things. And finally, hope. Um, the humble, confident hope in God's future, in his sovereign purposes for our world in Christ, enables us to act in love on the basis of faith to others without despair uh, or, or hopelessness, uh, without anxiety or fear, because we hope and trust in the God who is in charge of all things. So very brief principles just to bear in mind as we come to answer these questions. Lionel, if you want to join me, um, I'm going to uh, uh, ask some questions here in the auditorium, and there's some coming through on Slido as well. I'll start, first of all, uh, on Slido. And because I'm asking the questions, Lionel, I can, f I can give the hardest ones to you. <laughs> I can um, <laughs> send them back, I guess. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. First of all, and I, I was wondered if this one would come up, um, vegetarianism. So Jesus declares all animals clean. Mm. Um, 
so I guess the questioner is implying there's nothing intrinsically wrong with mm. eating animals. Um, but should Christians become vegetarians for environmental reasons? Um, how would you approach reasoning mm. that question through? Mm. Well, that's, that's an, an example of where I guess Christians uh, may disagree. Uh, and we do need to approach it from that point of view. So we've begun by saying, well, yes, uh, we need to be thankful for bacon. You know, God's given us bacon um, and we can be thankful for it. It is a, it is a right um, thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, as we look around and we actually think about the way that the world itself, uh, we've been able to have, you know, create so much technology and the technology has enabled us to do so many things with animals that we weren't able to do previously. Uh, we've been able to sort of, you know, get more and more animals and, and breed them and, and we can do things that, you know, in terms of our technology isn't necessarily great for the animals themselves, uh, but also uh, we are actually able to use so much of the resources just basically to create steak and hamburgers and that kind of thing. So I can see that uh, what that's doing then is that my desire to have a huge amount of, of meat uh, you know, if we actually inform ourselves, we can actually see how much water and how many resources that actually uses. And out of love of neighbour, we might decide, well, I'm going to eat less meat. Um, or we might decide, actually, I'm not going to eat any meat at all for that, for that reason. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a possibility. Um, I'm not a vegetarian. Um, my, you know, I put in an ad for my sister, who's a, a, a food sort of person. She's not a vegetarian either, uh, but she certainly looks to, towards sustainability when it comes to food. So. That's an excellent answer. The other thing, the only thing I'd chip in on that, Lionel, is what I was just saying about consequentialism. It, uh, mm. it really bears upon this question, mm. uh, in that the in one of the main arguments for an environmentally conscious vegetarianism is that the consequences of eating eating meat mm. are detrimental, and those are consequences that are obviously very broad and complex, and part of a very broad and complex interpenetrating system. And so, uh, I, I think what you've said is excellent as a way of of thinking about how our choices affect others and acting in a way that, that we think would be most helpful. But in doing so, I would just urge mm. caution in mm. an over simple assumption that we do understand all the interconnections of those different factors and can make strong assertions, for example, mm. that, that this is definitely wrong because mm. this will almost, this certainly is going to hurt the environment in this way when the interconnections in the environment are, are incredibly complex. So mm. yep. I would just urge some caution on the consequentialist nature of the argument. Yeah, is that, I, fair I, enough? That, that is fair enough. And, and this, is, this is just to add something else. I don't know if it's just the one question. Um, sometimes, you know, we can actually become, have that feeling of moral superiority as well. Yeah. Uh, that I'm better than you because I'm a X, and if X is vegetarianism, then um, at that point, that's that's it's starting to become very dangerous. It's self-righteousness. Mm. So that would just be extra. Thing. And it also transgresses what the New Testament says about this issue particularly. So it mm. says, be careful about issues of food and don't divide over them. Mm. I don't start being doctrinaire with one another and accept that even in, in the New Testament times, <laughs> issues of what should be drunk, what should be eaten, mm. um, and uh, reasoning about that, Christians differed, and we should not find ourselves split uh, and having little parties over things as unimportant as food and drink, according mm. to things. Let's, get, let's move on to one from the auditorium. If someone in the auditorium wants to ask us, and yes. So the, can I repeat the question? And, and the Lionel, um, yeah. So uh, the, the question is um, something that Lionel did touch on briefly in his book, but not in this, in this lecture so far. What would you say about how Christians could get involved at a broader and political level mm. uh, in these kind of issues? And our questioner referenced the fact that Christians have done this in the past. Mm. Uh, yes, so uh, it's a good question. Yeah, obviously, I uh, can't have included everything. But um, uh, I've, I spoke a few weeks ago at uh, the Arosha Creation Care Conference, uh, which happened, uh, it, it was actually across in uh, Christ College um, in, in um, uh, Strathfield. And the Arosha organisation is a Christian organisation, which is actually designed and is set up in order to um, be involved in creation care, to unite people who are involved in creation care and to uh, in be involved in lobbying and a political, that sort of political uh, setup. So um, I would say, uh, again, as I mentioned, Christians will differ, uh, but it was actually really encouraging to see Christians there who are seeking from a biblical point of view uh, to be involved and to organise themselves uh, again, you know, with all the complexities and people will differ, but to actually organise themselves um, and many, and I, I, met a, I met a Tasmanian um, 
uh, Christian who was an environmental activist from the 70s. So there was a, you know, there's a uh, grey beard there, but that was that was great. So th there are organisations that you could join, and I, I think Arosha is a good one, as, as I've looked at it. Um, and there's different things you can do. Uh, uh, sorry, A, space, R-O-C-H-A. <laughs> Uh, I keep forgetting exactly what it means, but it's a creation care organisation that's uh, based around the world and has just started up in Sydney. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. I, th I think the only thing I'd add, Lionel, is um, that, um, that political engagement and political involvement, like many things we do to serve our culture and society, mm. is something that dis different Christians do at different levels, just as we do various things that serve our society. So mm. some of us are doctors, some of us are called to be carpenters, mm. some of us are called to be politicians and become an end of the political life and do that to serve our community by addressing some of these mm. areas, and that yeah. Christians get involved in the apparatus of political engagement and involvement as they get involved mm. in any aspect of our society mm. is part of being a Christian in the world. So mm. it's, a, it's a perfectly appropriate and good thing to do, it seems to me. Mm. Another question from Slido. Um, is God going to hand us over to destruction via climate change or will common grace maintain life as we know it? Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to answer that question, Tony? Yeah, OK, <laughs> it's my turn, is it? Um, uh, I'll, I'll give it a go, Lionel. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, what you were saying about the world being in God's hands and that God's future being Jesus Christ and Jesus being the ruler of our world who will come to bring judgment to our world um, gives us confidence about our future. It doesn't give us confidence about any particular set of arrangements here on earth in terms of, uh, of plagues, of, of other disasters in human life. There, there have been... There have been some phenomenal catastrophes in the world's history. We think that we're the only generation who's ever contemplated events on Earth that might have significant impact on our world, but there have been um, massive disasters in world history that have wiped out vast numbers of humans. And, and were that to happen again through human inaction, folly uh, and stupidity, or just through natural events that are beyond our control, then that would be another of event within the in the cursed judge world in which we live that's fallen and in which we often experience either just the nature of the world as a fallen place or we experience the consequences of our folly. Mm. Um, but it doesn't, in my understanding of the, of the Bible's teaching, stand in the way of, of God's future and God's plans for his world and his people. Mm. Yeah. I think that, that's right. I, I, would, I would add, I, I don't know exactly how God is going to hand us over to destruction. I don't think the Bible actually says that. Uh, and so um, there's, I, I think it's as Tony said, but there's, a, there's uh, climate change could be really, really bad for us. Like it could be really, really bad. Um, you know, that's, it's not, um, and that's, but it's not the same as saying that it is God's mechanism for annihilating the world as we know it, you know, but when you say it's not God, God's mechanism for you know, annihilating the world as you know it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do something about it or whatever. Or yeah. seek to, yes, that's in right. some sort of way. So I think the question that is suggesting is it our fault, basically, because mm. <laughs> we, we've, we've over-dominated. Yeah, it, it, seems, it seems like it. That's what the scientists seem to be saying. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from here? Yeah, Bethany. So the question is, um, b both sides of the argument use consequentialism as a word. Those who, who want to preserve the economy as it is, say that technological materialists want to keep things growing, say we cannot afford to. The results of taking drastic climate action will be so bad on the economy, we can't do it. And vice versa. The other side says we have to do it because of the consequences. Um, your question is your question, is the economy and its health or otherwise, is that the best way to think about it? Is that the best criteria for thinking about whether or what we should do? Uh, yes, uh, well, Over to you, the, yeah, the, what is economics? Economics is, uh, as far as I know, my economist friend who, who tries to school me in, in these things and has given me books to read on econ and economics, they haven't read them all. Um, it's really seeking to measure things, so you try and measure as much as you can, and then you try to create models to see what will happen. So it is actually a very, very, very consequentialist thing to do, economics. and. The economic arguments that are happening at the moment is about, well, what do we measure? Uh, so part of the problem with economics, it's one of its great limitations always, is that what we do is we say, well, what's important to us? Then we measure it. And then the things that we measure actually become the things that are important to us. And so we, we, we sh what we should do is we should measure what we value. But what we end up doing is valuing what we measure. Yeah. So there are different 
kinds of ec economists who will say, well, if we measure GDP, it's going to be bad for GDP. And then there are others who come and they say, well, well actually, we should, we should actually measure the effects on the world and, and on human life. So that's part of the limitations of consequentialism. At the same time, economics is a very useful tool to use to try to make predictions about complex things and try to sort of bring some kind of order to, to, to consequentialist thinking. But it's got the limitation of being consequentialist. I'm not sure if you've got any... Yeah, that's brilliant, Lionel. Yeah. I, um, economics is largely about the allocation of resources and how you make measurements to, to allocate resources in a market sort of way. And um, if, if the... If the values that we hold, or the things that we, we hold as most important, are material, which is one side of the argument you're presenting, that because our material well-being might suffer, we cannot afford to do anything, um, kind of plays into that worldview that, that we've talked about earlier, where that's the main thing that matters, or that's the ultimate value, as Lionel was saying, that by which we then make all our choices and the criteria by which we make our choices, as if once we've become relatively prosperous as a nation, what is our goal? Our goal is just to become more prosperous. It's constant economic growth, which in and of itself doesn't seem to be uh, a good to me, that just more things for the sake of always growing and having more things, uh, that, that's, that, that that's a goal and in and of itself seems quite inadequate as a description of human goods, of the kind of things we might value together and organise our society around. Mm -hmm. So, I, in other words... I think what your question goes to, which is really helpful, is that there's a bigger thing to be asked than, sim than simply two versions of consequentialism. We have to be asking what, are the, what sort of world do we want? What's the, what are the values and goods we want to flourish around as a community and a culture and a society? And how do we organise ourselves and allocate the things we're doing in order to achieve that? Uh, and that's, I think, something that Christians have a real contribution to make in because um, we point to, to the... To our, not only to our historic traditions in the West that give shape to those values as to what's truly good in a society, but we point to the God who made the world and who therefore teaches us what is good. Mm. Mm. You happy yeah. enough with that? That's great. All right. <laughs> yes, you've had your hand up for a while. What's a distinct... I mean, mm. I'll try and phrase the question. How do, we, how do we distinctive... And it was very similar to a question that's been asked on Slido, mm. without just concentrating on economics and economies and those kind of consequences... How do we stand out and say something specific and different that's Christian in, the, in this thing, especially in terms of people's salvation? It's very similar to the question that's here mm. on Slido. How do, what would it mean for Christians to be different and to stand out mm. in this area? Mm. Yeah. Yes, and it's, that has got to do with the decisions that we make about our, um, I guess, our funds and, and our life and what we do. It's important to remember uh, that um, there are billions of people in the world who could make a difference uh, to the world through, you know, action on climate change. But the only people who are going to do anything about preaching the gospel to the world are Christians. So no one else is going to do anything about that. <laughs> uh, so as Christians, we are uh, placed uh, to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world uh, in such a way that the rest of the world is not placed. Now, that's a really obvious thing to say, isn't it? But we need to remember that, and that will help us in terms of our thinking about priorities. At the same time, we need to remember that as we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, we're proclaiming it to human beings who live in the world. Uh, and we are human beings who are proclaiming it to the world. Uh, and if we're, say, funding gospel ministry, what are we actually funding? We're funding people to be able to eat, to eat food and to live in houses and that kind of thing. It's all caught up together in one sense. Uh, so um, you, can't, you can't, you know, tear them apart. Uh, and we do actually need to, you know, do something just about the, the environments that we live in. Um, and even if that, you just take that down to your, your house. And, you know, you, if you're, gonna, if you're a, a minister of the gospel, I've been a minister of the gospel, well, I've had to still spend a lot of time just looking after the house and looking at and making sure that we get fed and that kind of thing. Uh, it's all caught up together. However, at the same time, there is a real priority in the sense that people need to hear about Jesus. Because, and I've not done all the, all the modelling, um, but societies that are affected deeply by the gospel of the Lord Jesus are on average uh, tend to be stabler and stable economies <laughs> do actually help 
in a big way when it comes to looking after our world. So there's, there's yeah, that's just a, that's a series. Of, I think there was about three random thoughts that came to my mind. I just sort of stitched them together. There, you might be able to stitch them together better, Tony. I don't know, but it occurred to me as you, as you were speaking and as we've been talking that in many ways the kind of actions that we're thinking we might take do fit into the theologically, I think, fit into the same categories as we think about other good things we do in the world. Hmm. So those of us who are doctors um, or research scientists seek to solve problems and help people in our world in all sorts of ways because they care about people and they want to do good in the world and serve other people and do good things in our world. Hmm. And that sometimes make enormous differences. Um, and people who are economists and business people also do the same if they're good business people. They can raise people up and give them flourishing and opportunity and jobs and all sorts of stuff through the activity they do in the world. Hmm. I think those of us who are called, abled, expert, um, uh, gifted, in working in this area and seeking to help our world make progress and thinking more sustainably and helpfully about our resources that are active, people that we might be active and do, it's, it's in the same kind of category. It's a, mm. it's a mode of service to our world and it's no more an alternative to gospel work than being a doctor is an alternative to mm. gospel work. I'll put it that way. Mm. It's a different kind of work. Mm. Um, the gospel work's a, a, an overlay on all of that. Mm. Uh, another question here. Um, environmentalism, I oh know, sorry, one above that. What practical things can we do to encourage our churches? to care for the environment. Uh, ministry funding or paying for carbon offset. Oh, I think they're supposed to be alternatives. Should we, f we pay the minister or pay... No, I don't know what that is. Plastic cups in communion or morning tea, so should we not have plastic cups? Um, voting, talking about voting in the democratic process. So what sorts of ways can church communities pick up the kind of thoughts and ideas that, that you've been exploring or apply the sort of principles mm. that we've been exploring, do you think? Mm, yeah, and this is just you get to the... the uh, slightly to the level of example. Uh, I think the first thing we need to keep remembering is that sometimes when we say the church should do something, uh, what we often mean is that the, the structures of the church or the ministers of the church or the, you know, the, the, the finances of the church should do something. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, the case because the church is the people in the church. And so what we can do is to actually encourage people in, involved in, um, in, in some of these areas of work and to encourage people just to, in their own lives, put greed to death, uh, to love the neighbour, to love others. Uh, one thing that maybe is a, is a challenge, uh, when I was at the Arosha Creation Care Conference, I was sitting in a group of people, we were discussing, I can't remember the question we were discussing, but um, the, the, uh, many of the people in that, era, in that group were working directly in what they call creation care industries. Uh, whether that is you know, involved in, in parks or, or uh, yeah, var various you know, renewables, that kind of thing. Um, and they, they all actually said uh, to, yeah, all of them, they sort of agreed, uh, that they actually find themselves between two worlds because they, they talk to their colleagues who are involved in sort of these, these creation care things and they say, well, how can you be a Christian and be involved in this? Because Christians don't care about this kind of thing. And they go to their churches, and the churches go, well, how can you be a Christian and be involved in that? Because isn't that sort of a left-wing, greeny sort of environmental thing? And, you know, like, and so they're, 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 they're caught. So one thing that we can actually do is just care for and listen to and hear from those who are involved directly in those, uh, in those uh, industries. Um, we don't necessarily have to, for the churches to do something, it doesn't mean that we have to divert our, our funding or, or, or whatever, but, you know, there's things that we can do, uh, and there's all sorts of schemes. You know, there was a, there was a solar panel scheme going, and less so now. Um, and yeah, thinking about how we use plastic cups in communion at morning tea is is worth doing. Uh, and actually, you know, think about can we save, you know, the the um, you know not use the plastic and use it some other way. Um, of course, if you go for the common cup, then you've got other questions other and issues. issues. That's right, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, unwell people uh, uh, use a huge amount of resources. <laughs> um, we could sorry. wash up the plastic yeah. cups. You could wash up the plastic Bags cups. Bags not doing that. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> um, but actually thinking about it is worth it because um, what we are is we are human beings involved in, in yep. church. Um, other practical things we can do, you know, look after the gardens at church and all that kind of thing and create a garden and that can actually be a really great way of connecting with the community to, to do community gardens. There's an example of, of things I've heard. 
Yeah. Now, there's a final question here just on Slido, which I'm really tempted to ignore because it's 903, but I think it would be unfair because I suspect a number of you have this question. Um, environmentalism seems closely tied to secular progressivism. Why is this and how should we navigate this, this cultural climate? Uh, this, this great question. Um, I was going to mention something similar to this earlier, but I just cut it out as we we're going along. Um, there, there are two impulses that are constantly at work in our culture. Um, not the only two impulses, but two opposed impulses that are both good in their own ways. Um, there's a conservative impulse, which is the impulse to preserve, conserve, and pass on that which is good, that, with that which our, our society has developed that's been helpful and useful. And so the conservative impulse is, if we've been doing it for a long time and it's produced good stuff, we should be slow to throw it out. It values the past and is very grateful for the past, but correspondingly is then quite reluctant to change and is suspicious of change. The progressive impulse um, looks at the opposite. It says there's all sorts of stuff that's wrong with what we've done in the past. It tends to look at the past with a very critical eye and say we need to start again. We need to... We need to start all over again and, and, um, and, and tear down much of what we've already done because it's all just a disaster. We need to build a new and better world. Um, now, described very simply, that's the progressive and the conservative impulse. And you can see how they both actually have something to them because there are good things that have come through from the past that we should be grateful for, but there's also plenty wrong with what we've done and we've got to open our eyes and not be blind to the faults, sometimes the systemic faults, of where we find ourselves. Um, now, for all sorts of reasons, um, the environmental movement, environmental movement hasn't always been, um, you'd think it would be a conservative impulse, in a sense, because we're trying to conserve what's good about the world and not see it destroyed. And there is a whole stream of, of conservative, um, um, I grew up in uh, country New South Wales, and the uh, country party and the national party were always going on about land care, about flood mitigation, about all kinds of environmental causes, and they were going on about it all the time. But the current um, uh, greener, more green secular left version of environmentalism um, inhabits the progressive spirit largely because it's all, it can be part of that particular political program, in other words, a program that wants to really reframe and reshape society quite radically and tear down what's here more and build up something new. And that's, just for historical reasons, that's where the green movement has been the, the, the sort of a uh, large part of it has been living over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And so the two do seem to be closely tied together, and that gives Christians some problems um, as we try and navigate that. There's a very brief kind of diagnosis. Um, why is this? It, it's because uh, that's the way progressivism works. It, it's, it's about pulling down what's here and building something new, and the environmental set of causes very nicely fits with that. Um, climate change, in a sense, and the emergency of climate change is a great kind of pretext in a sense to say we need to change society totally and so it fits very nicely with a progressive political view. Mm. So that's that's a brief set of comments on that. Do you want to say anything? Mm. Oh, just that, uh, I mean, this is this is again a bit of an analysis. If we're living in a, in a Western society and especially the English-speaking world, I think, and especially Australia and America, so this is, may not be a global thing actually, uh, but uh, we're living in a society which is itself um, moving away from its roots, its social roots uh, in the gospel and the effects of the gospel in, its, in the social um, uh, sphere. And what that means is that there is a, uh, um, almost a, you know, Christians, we want to hold on to the gospel. And if we're moving away from the gospel, then we've sort of got a default conservative reaction. Because there's something we want to conserve. There's something we want to conserve, which is fundamentally the gospel. The gospel. But yes. what our challenge is is actually to keep remembering what we need to conserve is the gospel. That mm. doesn't mean we need to conserve everything any, about... Any particular economic structure that's or right. any yeah. particular set the, of norms. The, the wonderful you know, smoking of the 1950s or something. We must conserve that because it's the 1950s. We don't do that. But that's what we have to keep realising because Christians are people who believe in repentance. We believe in change. Uh, and if you're a Protestant, which I am, you believe in reformation. Uh, and so that's, that's institutional repentance. <laughs> so we do believe in progress in the sense that we believe that the gospel, going back to the gospel, must reshape everything that we do and that we make mistakes and that we're not perfect and we've got to keep changing. And so to actually tease those things out 
is a difficult thing to do, but we we do need to do it. Or to be conservative and progressive at the same time That's right, is yeah. a difficult thing to do, but I think a, a balancing act we need to do. Well, that's taken, a, taken us a few minutes over time. Look, will you thank Lionel again for being up here? Thanks, 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 Thank you.